the mines were operating in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and people came to the basin and they saw this landscape, so many times the first, oh, they strip mine there. You know, because you would see this destroyed landscape on the surface, and they told you it was a mining community, and so they went, oh, they must have strip mined it. And trust me, this got out in several major publications around the country where, you know, the, the writer just <laughs> didn't do enough due diligence. Uh, and there's actually, you know, a couple of a couple of articles and books that appeared in the 60s and 70s that I do not give to people for source material because they have too many inaccuracies in them. And I don't want, if you were trying to write a research paper, I'm not going to give you that for source. And if you say, oh, I found this article, I'm going to go, well, let me send you the one that I've corrected. And it's not that I'm a genius or anything like that. But most people that saw this didn't realize what had happened was a hundred years ago, like we talked about outside. It began with them cutting the trees for fuel and the early smelters not being able to recover the sulfur. They realized in the beginning the potential to make sulfuric acid. We have in the museum's collection documents from those companies in the 1860s where they're talking about the potential to make sulfuric acid, how profitable making sulfuric acid will be, and how it will become the leading industry. Uh, and the writers of those reports in the 1860s were correct. The problem was it was 40 years before they had the technology to let them do it. So, you know, we love the word state of the art. You know, oh, this is state of the art. And, and you know this, I'm not telling you something you don't know, but all that means is best method available. You know, state of the art today is obsolete tomorrow. You know, I, I mentioned I was an Apollo kid. The computers, they used to land people on the moon. This has way more processing power in it than those computers that they had in the 1960s and 70s. But at that time, that was cutting edge technology. So where I'm going with this, that open roasting that it talked about in the film and the fact that they were ending up devastating this landscape, they were using best methods available. Now, you can say, well, they shouldn't have done that. Didn't they know what was going to happen here? But, you know, I'm going to make you think outside a little bit. You know, we are doing things today that we know are causing problems. But, but, and I'm not talking about as individuals. I'm saying we as a society have said the benefit outweigh the cost. You know, most of us agree that what comes out of our exhaust pipes is not great. But I love the freedom that that four-wheeled vehicle gives me. I love the fact that if I decide to go to Chattanooga this afternoon, I can go to Chattanooga, you know. So the prevailing mood at that time was, and, and again, I'm not excusing their action, but one, 50 square miles of timber in a corner of Tennessee that most people would never see was considered a good trade for the metal that was coming out. And the other thing is at that time, literally we, as a nation, and probably almost every individual, we could not foresee a day we would use all the resources up in this country. We, we thought they were endless. We thought they were boundless. You know, so, you know, we, we see things differently today, but it's not that, you know, these, these people were uncaring. You know, it was just cost-benefit. Is benefit worth the cost? And if we say yes, then we do things. But with that said, we've got a letter from a gentleman that came up the Okoe River in the 1860s and talks about how the river is running red and it is devoid of fish. Because once they started cutting these trees, what happened? Yes, sir. Yeah, the loose spirit went into the river. Yes. Soil erosion began to move off site and wow. entered the river. And we know what muddy water does. You know, it's no oxygen, no sunlight. Uh, it scours the bottom. It does all of these devastating things to the aquatic life. And they just started mining in 1850. And this letter is 1866. And he's talking about how the Okoe is already devoid of aquatic life. So for the majority of the 19th century and well through the 20th century, there was almost zero aquatic life in the Okoe River because of the erosion and sediment impact. Yeah, the heavy metals play a part in that? Yes. You know, from time to time, industrial spills, yes. You know, y'all don't remember a day, but we used not to have a Clean Water Act. You used to be able to discharge whatever you wanted to into a ditch. 
So a lot of things that were pollutants and toxins used to be routinely discharged into our watershed. But it all started with just the soil erosion. So now we're going to jump forward. You know, technology's changed. They've developed a way to recover the sulfur, make sulfuric acid. There, this is happening by 1990. They are not meeting 2018 emission standards in 1909. But the bulk of the sulfur dioxide is now being captured and converted to a product. Uh, so much so that by the 1920s, the companies on the ground here, and at that time there were two, Tennessee Copper Company and Ducktown Sulfur Copper and Iron, began to talk about revegetating this impacted landscape. Now, you know, it wasn't totally out of the goodness of their heart. But there also were no laws on the books saying you will do this. But their, their rationale or their reasoning was, was two or three things. One, they owned all this property and were making nothing off of it now. And they're like, you know, if we grow some trees back on there, we'll harvest some timber, we'll get some return. Because, you know, I told you the, mile, the mines would fit in a two by three mile rectangle. The actual industrial footprint here was about 2,500 acres that actually had something on it. The companies here owned upwards of 30,000 acres. Most of the land they owned, they only owned it because they had bought it to cut the trees off of 100 years prior. So, one, they're like, we can grow some trees. And two, you had begun to get what were called smoke damage lawsuits in the 1890s and early part of the 20th century, citizens began to sue the companies for the emissions. You know, one, before the acid plants were built coming off the roast yards, and then two, even after the acid plant was completed, they weren't catching all of it. And it's, you know, but they weren't suing for health. These were what were called nuisance laws. They were suing because it was damaging their timber, it was damaging their orchards, it was damaging their garden. It was damaging their truck packs that maybe they grew vegetables that they sold to supplement their income. And these got lumped under the term smoke lawsuits. And ultimately went to the Supreme Court a couple of times. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because that's not the focus of our story. But if any of you ever are interested, shoot me back an email and I'll wear you out on that topic. But some of the first environmental cases ever tried. And the companies are like, hey. If we can start to regrow stuff on this property around us, we'll stop those lawsuits cold. Because you can't claim that we're killing something 10 and 15 miles away if we're regrowing things 2 and 3 miles away. So you find that in the literature back in that day. The other reason is the plants on the Ocoee River, Parksville, and number 2, the flume line predate TVA. They were built by a private electric company in the teens, Tennessee Electric Power. And TEPCO is starting to go, hey, all this sediment and soil that's coming down the river from your property is A, silting in our lake, so we're losing storage capacity, and B, it's wearing out our turbines because it's like running sandpaper through them. And so there are letters that if you read it, you know, you can see threats of litigation in the lines. You know, it's things like we may be forced to and that type of language. So... You know, again, I like to say the companies were trying to get in front of a problem. You know, it's a lot easier for you to go clean your room up on your own than me to tell you not only you're going to clean your room up, but how you're going to do it and where you're going to put it. So they were they were somewhat proactive, but somewhat they're trying to butter their own bread. You know, they were wanting to save money and not get sued. But. The first year we find them planting trees is 1929. The Bridge of Company bought 5,000 trees and set them out in 1929. By the 30s, the companies are entering into research agreements with U.S. Department of Agriculture. And what today is called Natural Resource Conservation Service. It used to be called Soil Conservation Service. And TVA comes into existence in 33. And TVA is very involved here because this is a perfect laboratory for studying soil erosion and methods of combating erosion. And they have acquired these Ocoee plants and are planning to build others, and they're building dams all across the watershed. So a lot of work was done here in the 30s trying to, A, understand erosion, how does it occur, what kind of rates happen, 
what can we do to combat it? So they tried a lot of different types of plants. That's when kudzu got introduced. That's when uh, fleece flower, uh, what locals call chicken shade or wonder weed, got introduced. A lot of exotics. But they also began planting the Virginia and Loblolly pines in big numbers, and that's what you see a lot of outside today. Those were selected because they were fume tolerant. You know, again, I told you they weren't catching all the sulfur dioxide, just most of it. And some types of pines can't take an elevation of SO2 where the Virginia and Loblollies can. So they were looking at what would even survive here and grow. And they started planting trees. 30s were spent doing research. They had a plan that was produced in the, in the early part of 1941 that I hope all of y'all are aware of something happened in December of 1941. Pearl Harbor. Yeah, that put all that on hold for the next four years. So they really didn't start planting trees in big numbers until after World War II. But by the end of the war, 46, 47, they're in here planting trees in huge numbers. And they started out on the edge because the problem as we started was erosion and the further out you moved the less severe the erosion so the better chance you would find some viable soil out on the perimeter so the 40s and 50s they had fairly good success getting what I call the outer band replanted which was roughly about 10,000 acres but that left about 22,000 that was still totally barren they're setting out tens of thousands of trees a year. This photograph is 1973. Now they've been planting trees for 40 years by the time we look at this photograph. And this is still how it looked in 43. So it wasn't for lack of effort. It wasn't for lack of trying. It also wasn't because of what the company was doing in the 20th century. It goes all the way back to where we started, the level of erosion. All the topsoil had washed away, all the subsoil had washed away. It had washed down the Okoe River. You know, if you've been down on Parksville in the winter, and they, and they can't pull it as low as they used to. You know, y'all probably don't remember this. A few of you may. You know, they used to pull the lake down to Winter Pool, and there were these big mud flats in the back of the lake. We're going to talk in just a second while they're not there anymore. But or why you don't see them. They're still there. Um, what they determined, and this was the, by that time we were with one company, was that, you know, they're like, we're setting out trees and nine out of ten trees are dying within one year of being planted. And the one that lives doesn't produce a seed because it doesn't mature. You know, eight, ten years later it looks like a bonsai. It's this big. Um, so the company asked the Forest Service to send a research team up, and they've since closed this office, but they used to have a lab in Athens, Georgia, that they sent a team up here in the 70s to try to come up with some new techniques to improve the survival and the growth rate. And there's a lot of research that went into it, but the two big things that they were understanding at this point and began to apply here, they are certain fungi that live in healthy topsoil and these funguses are supposed to be there. They actually, the plant needs them to be present. They live on the small roots.